Good to be back here uh, in Hobart again and in LCA again. Um, if you have questions any time, yell them out, raise your hand. Uh, uh, I can repeat them or get a mic to you. Um, with that, here we go. So I'm going to be covering a few topics here. Uh, a little bit about uh, memory models and how they can help with memory ordering. And uh, the first thing is, why would anybody care? I mean, memory models are kind of a formalism, and we're practical people here, right, in the kernel, so what's the point? Uh, well, here, here's an example. Uh, this is what we call a litmus test. They look kind of like this. We got three threads in this case. We have test cases up to like 18 threads in a GitHub, on my GitHub thing, on a project strangely called Litmus. And uh, here what we have is we have everybody writing and then reading, and it's kind of in a cycle because thread one writes, reads, excuse me, what thread one's gonna write, thread one reads what thread two's gonna write, and finally thread two reads what thread zero wrote. And the question is, and this exists clause at the bottom, uh, is what gets evaluated at the end of time after all the dust has settled, is it possible for all of the reads to not see any of the writes, okay? So is it possible, you know, if, if this was fully ordered, which of course modern CPUs tend not to, um, especially in this case, we're writing then reading to different variables, uh, can we see uh, thread, thread zero's register being zero, thread one's being zero, and thread two's all be ze being zero, so that the reads somehow manage to avoid all the writes? And as I mentioned before, uh, modern processors, even x86 and the IBM mainframe, are plenty happy to take an earlier write and reorder it with a later read to a different variable. So that can happen. And if we actually rearrange the text to match the arrows, like that, you can see all the reads can happen first, in which case it's really straightforward that we could have all zeros, like the existing clause says. And uh, that's actually a pretty simple one. They, a, two-thread version of that actually appears in the Intel x86 manual saying, yes, this can actually happen. But suppose we have something like that, okay? Well, we got some releases and some acquires, some memory barriers, a bunch of read onces and write onces, and, you know, can we have this cycle where, where everybody goes around in a circle? Can that happen here? Well, if you're really interested in problem solving, whip your cell phone out and take a picture of that. And, uh, you know, if you get bored in the middle, you, can, uh, you got something to do. Uh, but uh, for the rest of us, in the meantime, let's, uh, let's go ahead, and, and I think that might give you some idea of why a tool that actually had a formal model of what CPUs could do to Linux and could tell you what you could get away with on any CPU. I mean, no matter if I do this, no matter what CPU Linux is running, it's going to work, is kind of the question I would like answered as a developer of core kernel code. And there's some other things. Uh, uh, we've had tools like this for individual architectures, for x86, for ARM, for PowerPC, a few others, and they're great for education. You can say, okay, how's this memory stuff work? Okay, let's type the instructions in, the barriers, and can this happen? Uh, it's also a design aid. We've used the PowerPC one in, in IBM to find some bugs and verify some bugs and verify fixes in the uh, PowerPC specific code. Um, my hope is, that people who are porting new, to new hardware, you know, porting Linux to new CPU families, this seems to happen every year or two. We're up to like over 30 of these things now that uh, run Linux. Um, some of them I think are a little long in tooth, Deck Alpha for example, but they're still there. They have a very enthusiastic community that runs mainline kernels on their hardware, so you know, here they are. And uh, one thing I really hope this can lead to is that this memory model can be help with concurrency tooling. Uh, Google, the Google folks have some tools, KSAN and KTSAN they run. Perhaps if those understood the memory model, they could do a better job of analyzing the code. And there's uh, something called C-bounded model checker, and there's Nidhug that also do concurrency analysis. Now, this thing is not magic. Um, see, right now what we do, what we have, is we have this thing called uh, memoryvariors.txt. It's in the documentation directory in the kernel source. How many people have uh, heard of memoryvariors.txt? How many people have actually popped it open in an editor at least once? How many people have read it end to end? Wow, all right, you guys are serious. Good show, yeah. This guy's a hand, man, this is great. <laughs> yeah, how many people have submitted patches to memoryvariors.txt? Okay, um, I feel kind of lonely, but hey, you know, life's like that. Um, now, 
I think of memory barriers.txt as kind of this kind of path going through the mountains that gets you to kind of memory ordering enlightenment. And it's a good and sufficient path. You know, there's a few pioneers. We saw some people raising their hands, that's cool, who tread this path and get where they need to go, and that's wonderful. But, you know, we got a big community. We saw John Corbett's talk the other day talking about, what is it, uh, 200 new developers in each new release or something like that. And, and at some point, you know, we kind of like to have a super highway. And uh, unfortunately, as you see on the bottom half of this slide, this tool is not a super highway. I think of it as kind of a gravel road. I mean, you know, uh, you can get a logging truck, uh, logging lorry, whatever you call them here, or maybe a motorcycle or, or some fairly robust car or Jeep or something like that across it, but at least it's better than a footpath, right? So we're kind of, you know, trying to make the next step. One of the problems with it is you have extremely limited code size. You know, I'm sorry, with this tool, um, you do not take the entire Linux kernel, 20 million lines of it, and ram it through the tool and get anything useful. Uh, what will happen if you tried it is it would use up all your CPU, it could get its hands on and all the memory it could get its hands on and, and nothing would happen. In fact, you can't even take all of something smaller like RCU and jam through it. What this is for is uh, for your, you know, the core code. You take the little piece that's the important code that really matters for your concurrency and you can check that. Uh, in addition, this is, does not do the entire C language. Um, now something about that being Turing complete and us wanting this solver to happen in finite time. Uh, but uh, it does do a fair number of things, and we are increasing over time. Uh, now, the, the thing about memory barriers.txt, which is our current you know, definition of what Linux memory ordering is, is that it's mathematically incomplete. It, it never was intended to be a mathematical model. It was intended to be kind of a how-to guide, more or less. And uh, the thing is that what happens is people say, hey, can I do this? And, uh, you know, David, Peter, Will, and I go look at their thing and either say, no, that's a bug, don't do that, and fix it. Or maybe we look at it and say, well, you can kind of get away with that, but we don't quite recommend it. Or maybe say, hey, that's really cool. You know, we're going to add that to memory barriers.txt. And what that means is that memory barriers.txt has grown organically over time. It's not mathematically complete. And the problem is that the model we're talking about, this tool we're talking about, has to be able to answer any question. So we, we need kind of mathematical completeness of the memory model. And that means we can't just take memory barriers.txt and codify it because it isn't sufficient, which means we've had to expand on memory barriers.txt, and we've got a list of guiding principles we use to do that. Um, I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I think if you kind of read through them quickly, you can see that they're kind of reasonable. Uh, number one, by the way, uh, if we submit something that doesn't do number one is to our best of our ability, uh, there's this guy named Linus Torvalds that might have a problem with that. Uh, the rest of them uh, are kind of there. I mean, we need to support hardware, we gotta support software, and so on. Okay, so how do we get started with this? Well, for a long time, memory models were things that were kind of off in academic ivory towers. Uh, there would be, you know, I don't, how many people have heard of a guy named Koresh Garsharlu? He had, he had put a dis dissertation in the early 90s that had a mathematical model for pretty much every CPU that was around at the time. And the thing is like 400 some odd pages and it's filled with this mathematical text. Um, but that didn't have much impact on people doing work. I was doing parallel programming at the time and I found out about it and I looked at it and went, okay, well, whatever, and uh, went about my business. And I think a lot of other people did too. But in 2005, the C and C++ Standards Committee decided, you know, people have been writing parallel code in our languages for what, how many decades now? Maybe we should like add that parallelism to the standard. Um, and to do that, they needed a memory model. I joined that effort in about 2007. Um, and uh, that, that's in C11, C++11, that's actually there. And about 2009, there were some researchers who decided to break away from the traditional approach of saying, okay, you have to have this perfect mythical machine that keeps everything ordered and then we'll do something for you. Um, and actually decided to make real memory models, formal memory models, executable ones, for real hardware, x86, PowerArm, and so on. And uh, that, that started in about 2009, and, and uh, those are the things I talked about using to find, verify, and uh, bugs and, and verify fixes in the Linux kernel. Um, and there's a URL you can find out all about it there. It's really cool. But in about 2014, it started becoming obvious to me that memory barriers.txt had kind of, uh, well, we kind of outgrown it. Um, it's a rather large file. There's a lot of stuff in it. Uh, you can argue about whether the organization is good or not, but it's, it's big. And 
reading all this stuff and then trying to apply it is, is not straightforward. Unfor and so, you know, we have these models for this hardware. Why not have a model for the Linux kernel as a whole? Essentially, rather than just having a model for x86, a model for PowerPC, a model for ARM, have a model that gives you the intersection of all the guarantees. So we can say, you know, this is what the Linux kernel, no matter what processor it's running on, is going to guarantee for you. Unfortunately, there were some um, interesting requirements. We got a bunch of legacy code in the kernel, and some of it uses unmarked accesses. You just say you got a shared variable A, and you just you know, mention it in a, an expression. Or you just say if B is a shared variable, you say B equals some fool thing or another, and you, know, you aren't telling the compiler about it. Um, but we've got a lot of those, and something we have to live with. We have a rather wide range of SMP systems. Of the 30 CPU families, uh, something like almost 10 of them do SMP, and they all have at least slightly different memory models, and we have to deal with all of that. And also, we got a high rate of change. Um, the types of concurrent code that the, that the Linux kernel community is willing to use is growing fairly rapidly with time, which is, I think, a good thing. And also, we add a new CPU family every so often, and that CPU family and those usage patterns have to be taken into account with any formal memory model we have. As a result, I talked to a lot of people who had done memory model stuff, and they were saying, yeah, right, whatever. Um, you know, that's not feasible. We're not doing that. Until early 2015. So I was on a campus of a university in the UK, um, and there were some, it was a gathering of people, and there was uh, various professors, visiting professors, grad students, we were doing stuff. And I had a meeting with uh, a prof that I'd worked with in the, in the C and C++ standardization efforts. Um, so, you know, I get in this guest office, and the first thing I notice is a stack of printout. And this printout has been red. I mean, seriously red. It's got coffee stains on it. It's dog-eared. It's, you know, kind of crumpled. Coffee stains I mentioned before. It's scrawled on at least two different languages I recognize. And I get closer and look at it, and this printout is memorybearers.txt, which I thought was really cool. That was the first hard evidence I had that somebody had read memorybearers.txt cover to cover, not just to say they could read it, or not just to find something, but to understand the whole thing, all right? And uh, more than that, there was an executable model that went with it. And so uh, our, that was our project's founder, Shad Algliff, a uh, prof at University College London, also sidelines at Microsoft Research. And uh, one question you might have is, how the heck did she do this when everybody else is saying that it was infeasible or, or wrong or something? Well, the answer is she used strategy. Now, a lot of places, a lot of people will tell you strategy tells you what you're going to do, and, and strategies can. That's, that's a valid strategy. We're going to do X, Y, Z. But uh, another, the most powerful strategies are ones that say what you're not going to do. And uh, that's what she did. She kind of took out that first requirement of those three out a few slides ago. My first reaction wasn't exactly positive. I mean, we've got unmarked accesses, and if we have a memory model that doesn't deal with them, uh, you know, what uses that memory model? But upon thinking about it, if you're a developer or a maintainer for code that has unmarked accesses, it's on you to make sure the compiler isn't going to mess up your code. And what that means is you need to think about, okay, what could the compiler do to me? And that's going to end up with some related programs, which you could mark the accesses for because the compiler can rearrange your code. I mean, if you think hardware is weakly ordered, try a compiler, right? Um, and uh, not only that, they're creative. They keep making more of them. Uh, so if you've, if you've got that, you've constrained the compiler so it can reorder things only to this extent, then you have a certain number of different programs the compiler might write for you with marked accesses. And you just run the model on each of those, and you're there, right? So that seemed like a reasonable way. And the other real benefit of, of her approach is that a solution really was feasible. And she actually had a working model to start with that approximated memory barriers.txt. Um, and the problem is, is that there, there are some efforts um, modeling all possible compiler optimizations, but they're really in their infancy, and it's not clear what you do about optimizations that nobody's thought of yet. So um, it may be a while. OK, so we had this model. Uh, the reason she was talking to me is that uh, there were, she, she noticed that uh, memory barriers.txt wasn't exactly mathematically rigorous, and there were some ambiguities and, and omissions and so on, so she wanted my help with that. 
And also, she wanted to add RCU to the memory model so that you could not just have the reads and memory barriers and writes like we saw in the litmus tests earlier on, but also RCU read lock, RCU read unlock, synchronize RCU, and, and, and have them all work together. Uh, this you know, seemed like it was fairly straightforward. We've had several uh, formalizations of, of RCU. There's a couple of publications where we've done it. And so, you know, how hard can it be? How many people in the audience have heard of something called the Dunning-Kruger effect? <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's a good answer. He says he's an expert on it. <laughs> well, I, I learned a lot about it uh, in this process, let me tell you. <laughs> you see, we have the same problem with RCU that we have in memorybarriers.txt. The kernel uses a very small fraction of its capabilities, I mean, sometimes with very good reason. You can do some very strange things with RCU if you're creative enough, all right? Uh, but that means that all of our documentation of it, our description, in fact, our earlier formalizations of it were really incomplete. Um, and uh, Jad was trying to actually do the full semantics of all of RCU could do, and, and there wasn't enough information for her. So uh, uh, the way she did this was kind of an interview process similar to the way she worked with hardware architects. And what, the way that works is she makes a bunch of litmus tests that uh, sort of represent various questions she had, and she sends you a tarball of these litmus tests along with a text file where you can mark yes, no, yes, no as to whether the outcome was possible or not. Um, and uh, by some litmus tests, I mean several hundred. So summer of 2015, I would get these mails with tarballs and work through the litmus tests and go through them. Um, and I would send back my responses, and I would get uh, polite but very firm questions to, uh, you know, wait a minute, you said yes on this litmus test and no on this other one, and there is no theory that accommodates both of those answers. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll give you one example here. This is uh, uh, one of many, actually, but uh, the one that... Uh, uh, caused me the most uh, cognitive dissonance over some months. So what we have here, we have three processes again, and the first one and the last one, P0 and P2, have a reset critical section. So RC reset critical section starts with RC read lock, ends with RC read unlock. And uh, the middle one has a grace period, that's a synchronized RCU in the middle. And you can see it kind of has the same form as our previous ones, there's this kind of cycle of things where there's a variable between one process the next. So for example, P0 writes to X, and then P1 reads it. And that happens around in a circle. In fact, let's take a look with arrows to show that cycle. The white arrows show the cycle. The green arrow just shows the RCU um, guarantee, which is that if any read side critical section has any part of it before the grace period, that grace period is going to wait until that read side critical section completes. And so if we look at the bug on, this is kind of like the exist clause. If R2 is equal to 1, well, that means that that write over in P0 happened before that read because that's, it read it, okay? And that means that the read from Y has to get done before the synchronized RC returns, okay? And what it comes down to is if you have a, a read side critical section here and a grace period here, it's okay to do that, okay, to have the read side critical section end before the grace period does, and it's okay to do this, have the read side critical section start after the grace period does. It's even okay to do this, to have the grace period totally cover the read side critical section. It is absolutely not okay to do this. You cannot have the read side critical section span the grace period. That's, that's what RCU guarantees, that's, that's never gonna happen. And so the question is, can we get this cycle to happen given RCU's guarantee? There's no other real memory ordering here, just RCU. So um, uh, we'll, we'll, let's do a poll. Uh, I've got four options in the poll, kind of like a, an election in November, the four options there too. Um, uh, the first option is any system doing this should have been strangled at birth. How many people resonate with that approach? All right, yeah, we got uh, one brave man willing to sign up for that, cool. Um, number two, reasonable systems really do this. Okay, no takers there. Number three is there exist a great many unreasonable systems that do this. All right, we got some here. Yeah, we got a bunch of people liking that one. And the fourth one and final one, a memory order is what I give to my hardware vendor. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, the, the, the horrible thing is, um, it, what Jod would do is she would actually record 
the interactions we had in, in a comment header in the litmus test. And if you look at this particular litmus test on my GitHub, it says Paul allowed, says allowed says mid-June. That's June of 2015. What that means is that no matter what choice you chose, there was a point in time where I would have agreed with you. Well, number, yeah, if somebody asked even four, and, and well, yeah, number four, you might have to go back to the 1980s, but, you know, before I did anything with parallelism, but yeah, it's, it's true, it is. Um, and so uh, there was quite, I had quite a bit of confusion in my mind about this, and this, there were other ones. This one is just RCU, it's one of the easy ones. The hard ones had RCU and releases and acquires and memory barriers all worked strong together, and some of those were like, you know, uh, what is this? Um, so, yeah, this is the only litmus test causing me problems. Uh, this is how it can actually happen. Uh, remember, let's go back to the previous slide really quickly. Uh, we just got read once and write once. Now, the CPU cannot reorder those because those are volatile accesses. And x86 won't reorder them, nor will the IBM mainframe, nor Spark, uh, TSO, and a, and a bunch of other ones. But, you know, Itanium, Alpha, uh, ARM, PowerVC, they're all happy to. MIPS as well, I think. And so if you have a CPU, those weekly order CPUs, it's within its rights to do that. We've swapped the reads and the writes on P0 and P2. We can't do it on P1, the synchronized RCU is in the way, it doesn't allow it. Once we've made that swap, we've got the RCU guarantee to worry about. And uh, if P1 sees the write, then it has to wait. Synchronized RCU can't return until that RCU read unlock happens, so we've got that set up. On the other side, um, if, if we want uh, P2 to see P2, excuse me, P2 to see P1's right, so we want the right to Z to be read, um, then we have to have some part of P2 after the grace period, which means no part of P2 can come before the grace period. Remember, it's not legal for RC read side critical sections to totally engulf grace periods. That's the guarantees that will never happen. But once you've done that, you know, we can, we can have, uh, P0's read, read P, excuse me, P, P1's reads, read P0's right. We can have P0 read, read P2's right. And we can have P2's read, read P1's right. So the cycle can happen. And if you run the model, you'd see something like this. This is the output. I cut and pasted it into the slide. And the important part is right down here. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff where it goes through all the states it found. It's got witnesses, it's got hashes of the thing which various tools use. It says sometimes. And what it's saying is, well, this doesn't always happen, but for some of them it did. What this tool is doing is, it's, you can think of it, it's, it's axiomatic, so this isn't really accurate. But you can think of it as doing a full state space search and going through all the things that could possibly happen with this litmus test and reporting on them. Um, this can be slow sometimes. There's an option you give the tool to say, you know, I don't care about all the things that happen. All I care about is whether or not this can happen. And it'll just restrict its focus on the, on the assertion you give it. So this can happen. And uh, uh, so I spent a fair amount of the summer. The problem I was having was that she'd give me one litmus test, and I would happen to have SRCU, say, in my head, which has memory barriers on the readers. And then I'd get distracted and do something. A bug would come in or, uh, you know, something would happen. And then by the time I got to the next test, for whatever reason, I would just have RCU in my head, which doesn't have memory barriers there. And I'd be giving answers based on the implementation I'd last had my head inside of. And I needed to kind of back off and kind of come up with a platonic RCU, if you will, and say what RCU could do totally unconstrained. And eventually, after beating my head against this all summer, um, I came up with a general rule, which is that if you have one of these RCU examples with grace periods and read side critical sections and no other ordering, then as long as you had at least as many grace periods as you have read side critical sections, the cycle cannot happen. In our previous example, we had two read side critical sections and only one grace period, and therefore, the cycle could happen. Anyway, uh, uh, John actually liked that quite a bit. She called it principled, which is about as good as you can get from a theoretician if you're a kernel hacker. I mean, with, with one exception, we'll see later. Uh, but she also said this was kind of difficult to represent as a formal memory model. Besides which, I finally figured this out in September of 2015, and summer was over, and she's a professor, and that was that, right? But she did de designate a successor, which was pretty cool. Before we get there, though, before we get the successor, Jad was the first person to demonstrate that a Linux kernel memory model actually is feasible. She also forced me to gain a much better understanding of RCU. And, well, let's face it. They said it couldn't be done, and she did it. I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> and 
Anyway, her successor was a guy named uh, Luc Marangue, a picture of him there. Uh, he's at Inria Paris, uh, and he joined in November 2015. Uh, one challenge Luc faced was that this was his very first exposure to RCU. Um, he hadn't heard of it before. And so it was my turn to send out litmus tests showing how things could be done, uh, which I did, and, and gave rationales for why things could happen and why they couldn't. Uh, and one, one question you might have is, you know, machines don't have an RCU instruction. There's, there's no RCU grace period instruction. So what really happens is that there's this code that makes RCU happen using memory barriers, reads, writes, and locks and unlocks. And so, you know, why not just take that underlying stuff and make the model do that instead of having a separate model for RCU? And it turns out you can, in fact, do that. And so if you look in my litmus archive on GitHub, uh, you'll see these scripts that take RCUs and turn them into various sequences of instructions. Um, and so I was using that as that sort of thing as well to demonstrate what this was supposed to do. Uh, one weird thing about some of those models, there were some of them where you had to execute a memory barrier up here based on the result of a later load. And it turns out in these, these models you can do that. They're called prophecy variables. Basically, you take a random number and you make the decision of the memory barrier on that random number, and then you do the load later, and this exists clause, you add a thing saying, hey, these two things have to be equal, and if they aren't, you throw the execution away. So there's, there's a bunch of really weird tricks like that that are really kind of cool that you can do with these things. Anyway, uh, Luke made some models. We ran them against the litmus test. I'd return a scorecard, and we kind of slowly converged to where he was getting more and more of them right. Um, uh, one of the really nice things about all the guys I was working with, Luke especially, is uh, he really understood that you know, he had this theory, but it had no meaning outside of a relation to the real world. And so he many times, I need you to break my model, if he felt I wasn't trying hard enough, I guess. Uh, and uh, early on, I was able to do that fairly easily. But once it got to the point where I was having to generate seven-thread litmus tests to find a flaw in the model, um, I said, all right, you know, enough of this by hand stuff, and I wrote some scripts to generate them automatically. Uh, we got not quite 3,000 of them, and we add that with the 348 that uh, Jad was throwing at me in the summer of 2015. Uh, Luke decided he didn't want to be left out either, so he generated almost 2,000 of them uh, using a tool he had. Uh, moral of the story is that validation is, if anything, more important in theory than it is in practice, because in practice you just gen prove it works. In theory, you have to prove that it matches some practice that works, which is an extra step. But, but all this aside, we got this theory, we got this litmus test, we got it looks like it's agreeing. But the real thing is, I mean, there's formal memory models for the hardware, and does it match those? Because if it doesn't, it's broken. Uh, to say nothing, there's real hardware, and does this model actually match the hardware? Um, we, we have some uncertainty. We actually have two models uh, to allow for the fact that there's some questions we don't have the answer to at this point. Um, one strong, one weak. And then there's a lot of tests to be run. Who's going to run them all? Before we get to that, though, as uh, far as I know, Luke has produced the first high-quality memory model for the Linux kernel that actually included a realistic RCU model. And I think that actually deserves some recognition. So, you know. So uh, uh, Luke knew a guy named Andrea Perry, who's a, a, a PhD student at a university in Pisa, Italy. And uh, Luke, uh, 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 Andre was kind of had some interesting things to do. So he created a script that takes a litmus test and converts it to a Linux kernel module. He can then take that Linux kernel module and insmod it into a kernel running on one of the machines and then verify that, that if the model says something is forbidden, that the machine doesn't say it's allowed because the machine wins those arguments. He also uh, ran and compared against the hardware uh, formal memory models as well. Uh, he helped Luke add, uh, you notice we had this C language-like stuff. It's not quite C, but it's pretty close. Uh, before that, before uh, Andrea did this work, you had to have things instead of, uh, you know, R1 equals R1 of X, you had to have something like R bracket once bracket R1 X. And uh, I like the one on the left quite a bit better. I don't know about you. It's uh, a little more parsable. And then uh, Luke has some infrastructure where you can run thousands of... Uh, litmus test against a memory model, against a pair of memory models, and it'll take the differences and pop up the litmus tests that differ on the web, which was also very handy. Okay, and the results, uh, by the time we're getting towards the end of January, early February, we're looking pretty good, but 
the thing is, even though we got more than 5,000 litmus tests, there's the chance of just having gotten lucky, right? I mean, uh, 5,000 may be a big number, but infinity is even bigger, right? Uh, the other thing is that uh, I, got, I get along really well with Luke, but we're really, really different specialties. I'm a Linux kernel hacker, he's a memory model theoretician. Uh, plus, his native language is French and mine is English. Uh, his, French is way, his, fr his English is way better than my French ever will be, but then that's not saying much, right? And uh, it's really easy for us to talk past each other, to use the same words and mean two different things. And if that happens, we have a bug in the memory model, and probably a really subtle one, because if it was a glaring bug, um, it'd show up in the litmus test comparisons. So it became obvious we really needed a, a better bridge between the two of us to avoid those kind of communication failure bugs that would otherwise show up. But first, uh, Andrea developed and ran the test architecture, and we're talking about some really, you just, and if you think that's easy, you just try taking an untyp, untyped litmus test and producing something the compiler will accept in the Linux kernel. That's not easy. And he made all that work and did a whole bunch of work with that, and I think that deserves a round of applause. So I recruited Alan Stern. Uh, he's a staffer at uh, Harvard. Uh, you guys might actually know this guy as the maintainer of the Linux kernel uh, USB, HCI, OHCI, and UHCI drivers. However, this is not his life's work. He's done a fair number of other things. His uh, education is in mathematics, actually mathematical logic, which is actually really, really useful for memory models. And uh, he's got a huge list of publications. I picked three of them out here, one intentionally, the other just for the heck of it. In 1996, he and another guy wrote a book on nuclear magnetic resonance uh, processing. Uh, the second one, I don't know what to do aside from just read the title. De novo backbone and sequence design of an idealized alpha beta, beta barrel protein. Evidence of stable tertiary structure. Make of that what you will. The third one is uh, quite relevant. I'm a co-author on there as well. User level implementations read copy update. That uh, paper includes a semi-formal uh, a semi-formal uh, uh, expression of RCU's guarantees, and it also has a, a semi-formal proof of correctness of user space RCU. Um, in fact, you might notice I had a couple of publications before my Dunning-Kruger slide, and, and uh, that was one of them. Uh, the, those two pieces of that paper were produced by Alan Stern. So, you know, he has a good understanding of RCU as well. My hope was that uh, Alan would critique Luke's model, and he did do that by rewriting it. Um, I'm not going to go through this in detail. This is uh, half of the RCU model. And what this part deals with RC read side critical sections. So this first batch starts with uh, let matched on the top going down to in matched, kind of almost at the bottom there. Um, takes and handles the nesting of RC read side critical sections. Now, me, I'd have been happy with something that required you to start your litmus test with RC read lock, have a bunch of stuff and RC read unlock, and just have one, have it be restricted to only having one read side critical section in a process, and that'd be the whole process. But uh, that wasn't good enough for Alan. This actually handles uh, multiple of them, stuff before and after them, between them, and, and it also handles nesting of them. Uh, it also complains, there's those two flag statements uh, towards the bottom. Those will yell at you if you have mismatched RC read locks and RC read unlocks. And then the thing at the bottom, uh, produces a set of the read side critical sections themselves, which is used later on in the model. That uh, big let match thing, that's an excellent example of uh, what I think, what I've seen is the coding style of, uh, of uh, memory model theoreticians. I call it mutually, res uh, mutually assured recursion. What that is is a six mutually recursive, recursive set functions working together to work out the nesting and the, and the overlap and everything. Now, that's just the read side. You also need the update side. And I'm not going to go through this in detail either. If, if you're really interested, we can you know, grab me and we'll, I'll take you through it. But uh, the first one interfaces RCU to the rest of the memory model. The second two lines basically say that's how you get from, from one RCU thingy to the next, whether it's from a read side critical section to another read side critical section, like we had from P2 to P0 back there a few slides, or from a read side critical section grace period or between two grace periods. You use those to show how, you, how, you, how the, mem that's the memory model defines that connection. And then the rest of it, what it does, remember there was that counting rule. You have to have at least as many grace periods as read side critical sections to forbid the cycle. 
that just does a, a you know, set-based computation implementing that counting rule. And at the bottom, it says that essentially if you have one of these cycles that has as many grace periods as reset critical sections, that can't happen. You're supposed to forbid that. That's what the error reflexive means. So this handle is pretty much RCU in its full glory, which is cool, and it's 24 lines of code. Um, so anyway, uh, this, as far as I know, this is the first executable formal model of RCU, and I think that deserves a hand. That's really good work on Alan's part. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do, the, the, the actual model is about 200 lines of code, and I'm gonna go through about uh, three of them. And the purpose here is to kind of get you used to a couple of uh, three of the things. And the reason is that those, the, F, the RF, the CO, and the FR have really profound influence on how you design concurrent code. So it's worth going through them quickly. RF is reads from. It links from a write to some read, whether it be in the same process or some other process, that returns the value written. So it, it just links from a write to a read that hands back what was written. That's straightforward enough. CO isn't too bad either. Um, CO applies only to writes to the same variable. And what happens is CO links from a write to some later write. In other words, a write that overwrote the value of the previous write, the, from the previous write or a write after that. So it just makes an order of the writes. FR is a little weird, and we'll go into this a little bit later. FR is from read, but it's not exactly an inverse of RF. It's backwards in the sense that it links from a read to a write, but what it does is it link, links from a read to any write to that same variable, whether in the same process or some other process, that showed up too late to change the value read, okay? It turns out you can express that in terms of the other two, but um, if, you, if, if you really like uh, set theory, you can do that and it'll make more sense, but if you don't, it won't help. Uh, um, in any case, so what from read is, is you have a read from, from a variable, and there's some other write that wrote afterwards, essentially. If you think of it that way, you're not too far off. So we have this thing com for communication that just unions those sets together. So we have sets of relations between reads and writes. We union them together. And that sort of is, that's kind of how you communicate among processes is why we have com. You either have a write that goes to a read. You have writes that overwrite each other or you have a read that shows up and it gets a value before the write. And either way, you have some idea of what the ordering or relationship was between those processes. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second line is taking that, that set and pulling PO lock into it. So what's PO lock? PO lock's pretty straightforward. PO lock is confined to a given thread. So if you have any access to a given variable within a thread, if you have a later access to the same variable, you'll link the earlier ones to the later ones. All right? So we throw all those together and in in union them all together in a big pot, and we say that has to be acyclic. And it turns out that's the same as saying that everybody agrees on the order in which the writes occurred. Okay? Don't worry too much about getting through there. It's the single, uh, don't worry too much about how that goes together. The key point for this talk is RFCO and FR. Um, and, uh, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of do a little bit of an exercise on generating those, and then we'll show some consequences. So there's RFs here, or maybe there aren't. Uh, does anyone, anyone want to tell me where the RFs would go? What we've got, let me describe this. We have only one variable, let's say X. P0 writes to it twice, three then four. P1 reads from it twice in a row. And we're only worried about the ex execution where R1 gives us a four and R2 gives us a three. And that may seem kind of strange when you look at it, and if it seems strange, you've got it right, okay? So um, we have, we, we, we got some reads and writes, so maybe we've got some read from. So anyone want to tell me where the, which writes would connect to which reads? Well, we're kind of running short of time, so I'll, I'll uh, break the suspense, unless somebody wants to jump up and say right now. They're like that. They're crossed over like that. So the first, the first read gave us a four, so it had to get the right of four. The second read gave us a three, so it has to give us the right of three. There has to be a link between those two. Okay, the next piece is PO lock, and uh, that one's pretty straightforward. It's, again, what it does is it goes from a given access within a process to a given variable to a later access to that same variable. 
And I saw somebody gesture the correct thing, which is that you connect on the sides like that. Okay. The next one is CO, and that relates only writes, and it connects a write to a given variable to a later write to that same variable. Yep, okay, you got it. And there it is right there. It's, it goes along with the PO lock, so it goes from the first write to the, to the second write uh, because the write of four overwrite wrote the write of three. Okay, now for the fun one, FR. Remember, FR connects a read to a write that showed up too late to affect the value returned by the read. Anybody brave enough to say where that goes? We say that you got first write to where? First write to the second read. Oh, remember that FR goes from a read to a write. So, um, okay, we got R1 to four, but then that, but, but the four actually was the value returned, so that write didn't show up too late, but you got the right general idea of how they hook together. Okay, R2 to four, okay, very good. That's what happens. R2 gave us a three. There was a later write of four, and so that write of four showed up too late to affect R2, which is kind of strange because it did affect R1. Um, and that is strange, and in fact, if you look, there's a cycle. In fact, let's just make the cycle be bigger, bigger and reddish. We've got a cycle through these things, and that's exactly what those three lines of code says were forbidden. In other words, this execution is not allowed for this memory model, and you can't, that can't happen. So if it seemed like a really strange sequence of events to you, you're right. It is, and it's forbidden. Okay. Um, the thing is about these memory, uh, these things, RF, CO, and FR, okay, is that they're, uh, the, the key thing on it is that they are, um, RF is stronger. It follows with time, and uh, we can look at the thing later and see it. The other two can go backwards in time. What that means is if you can design your algorithms to use read from, to have writes connect to later reads, you can use lighter weight barriers. RC is an example of that. Because we have writes connecting to reads and other reads, we can have almost no synchronization at all, almost no barriers at all. And so if you want your stuff to be fast, that's the key thing to use. Anyway, uh, here we are. Uh, any any uh, questions or thoughts on that? Okay. If not, <clears throat> thank you for your time and attention, and uh, hopefully this is something that's useful to you. One thing I will go quickly through um, in the absence of questions, this is just showing how this stuff happens, is uh, that slide. You can actually download or run this thing. Um, and uh, let's see here if I've got uh, the right place here. I do not. In any case, um, I will post a slide. There's a, there is a, a tarball on the website. Uh, this shows you how to, in, uh, to install the tools. There's another tarball that you can download that will give you the other things you need. And you can actually type uh, things in and run them. In addition, on my GitHub account, there's a whole pile, all these different litmus tests we talked about generating, those are all there. So you can go and run it, and you can take these things and see what happened. So we've got uh, three more minutes of questions, or are we done with questions? Okay. Thanks. Uh, just a question about that validation tool that returned the sometimes response. Yeah. Is that iterating over a bunch of CPU models to um, reorder the code, or is that just running over all the states from the memory model? That's a good question. Uh, what's happening is that uh, it's the second one. What, what happened is that the memory model has been care very carefully constructed to only say things are forbidden if all the CPUs we understand say that it's forbidden. Okay, if, if even one CPU says, hey, that can happen, then the model has to say, yep, that can happen. Uh, now, it, doesn't, the, it isn't just the hardware. You also have the compiler and the uh, Arch-specific code. So for example, deck alpha uh, has an inconvenient way of saying you pick up a pointer, you read from, from the pointer, that can happen out of order. And that means that deck alpha has to have 
a strong memory barrier in a particular primitive called RCU dereference to make it so that the system, including DAC alpha, works correctly. Itanium is another example. Um, uh, we saw that funny thing with the reads coming out of order. I, bare itanium could really make that funny cycle happen. It allows reads to the same variable to be interchanged. However, if you use read once, that generates a volatile access, and the itanium compiler makes a special read instruction, that a read acquire, that pro prohibits that order, reordering. So exactly, it's the model has to handle everything, and some of the architectures have code in the compiler or the art specific code to make the right thing happen. All right. Right towards the end, you said there was a particular relation that we should look at when we're implementing things because it allows lighter weight barriers. Can mm -hmm. you say sure. that again with more words, please? Sure. <laughs> Let's get back to it here. Uh, this guy. So read from, you have a write and a read reads it. Now the thing is, the speed of light is finite and uh, computers are non-zero in size. This means it takes time for the write's information to propagate through the CPU. And, uh, but the cool thing is, unless you're doing weird speculation, user-visible speculation, I mean, it's okay to do speculation as long as you clean up if it comes out wrong, okay? Uh, but if, 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 you're, if the speculation is not visible to the user, then the write has to come before the read. It, there's no way to go backwards. And that means that if you have one of these read from links, it's temporally ordered and time is acting as a big memory barrier for you, okay? In contrast, um, if you have a pair of writes and you're looking at the thing happens, you can actually have an earlier write overwrite a later write. Okay, so the later write gets its value in first somehow and then the earlier write. And, and, and that, can, that happens, um, you know, like this. So what we've got is we've got the write, so CPU 0 is writing 1, CPU 3 is writing 2, CPU 1 and 2 are innocent bystanders, so we leave them out. They have store buffer and cache. The cache line is initially over on CPU 0. So, um, uh, CPU 3 does its write, and we cross out its instructions saying it's done, and uh, it doesn't have the cache line. So it just takes the value and sticks it in a store buffer, and sends out a request, hey, I need this cache line so I can finish this write up. Okay, so that request moves this way across. In the meantime, CPU 0 does its write, and it gets to the store buffer first. The request hasn't got there yet. Um, and then, um, uh, how about if I hit the right button? Yeah, there we are. And then because it's got the cache line, it can move the value into the cache line. And at that point, the request shows up, and it's going to carry that value x equal ones back. And then it'll put the cache line in there. And at that point, it's got the store buffer and the cache line value. We can actually finish the store. And we've seen an earlier write overwrite a later write. But that's kind of, if you think about it, it's kind of bizarre because what's really happened is the writes have taken different times, amounts. The later write took a shorter amount of time because the cache line was right there, it could finish immediately. The earlier write took a longer amount of time. And so CO is really ordered in terms of the ends of the writes. All right? Uh, the problem is you can't see the ends of the writes. Uh, you know, unless you've got some weird cache instruction, you dig the cache down, that'll take forever. Uh, all you can really see in software is the beginning of the write, and so we really have to think of it as going backwards in time from a software viewpoint. And then FR is the same sort of thing, because, and I'm not going to go through the, through the thing on this one, but uh, because it takes time for the write to propagate, you can have a later read, read something before the write happened. Okay, so because of that, um, if you have read from, if you have a write that a read accesses, you need a lot weaker memory ordering. You get a lot more efficiency than if, you have, if you're relying on pairs of writes or writes coming before reads, or excuse me, reads coming before writes. So that's, that, does that help? Yeah. Um, I suspect we're we are done time. at this point. Thank you again uh, very much. On and, behalf uh, of LCA, thank you very much. Thank you.